The following special presentation of your hometown Health Connection Community Conversations focuses on the Child Advocacy Center, CAC, a program of best self behavioral health. The show is presented in partnership with WBBZ TV and Buffalo Healthy Living Magazine with support from the Buffalo Federation of Neighborhood Centers, Karamea Pet Resort, Circuit Clinical, Endeavor Health Services, Medical Society of the County of Erie, the National Federation for Just Communities, People Incorporated, Community Services for Everyone, Horizon Health Services, Spectrum Health and Human Services, Best Self Behavioral Health. Hello, I'm John DeShulo. Children's Advocacy Centers, CACs, are community-based, child-friendly organizations that coordinate a multidisciplinary response to allegations of child abuse. The CAC in Buffalo brings together in one location child protective services, investigators, law enforcement, forensic interviewers, prosecutors, family advocates with a mental and medical health professional, providing a coordinated comprehensive response to victims of abuse. CACs provide a safe, neutral environment for children and their families where the child's well-being is a priority and where children can speak to a forensic interviewer who is highly trained to understand child development and therefore able to interview the children, particularly at that critical time. A multidisciplinary team approach like this results in better outcomes for child abuse investigations. Now we have some statistics for this show because we're going to highlight child abuse, bringing attention to the youngest and most vulnerable individuals in our community. And it's really important in Erie County, would you believe we have the second highest rate of reported child abuse in all of New York State with more than 3,000 cases of child abuse each year? Astonishingly, one in 10 children in our community will be sexually abused before their 18th birthday. And in many cases, it is silence and secrecy that allows the abuse to begin and continue. It's time for us to speak up for these children who can't speak for themselves. Let's meet our guests. Dr. Aram Ashraf is a board certified child abuse pediatrician, medical director for child abuse prevention services, and a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics, the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. Lieutenant David Mann has been a lieutenant in the Special Victims Unit of the Buffalo Police Department since 1995, the detective unit is responsible for investigating sexual assault, intimate partner violence, child abuse, elder abuse, sex offender management, human trafficking, and the Juvenile Bureau. He's a member of the boards of the Best Self Behavioral Health and the New York State Children's Alliance. Rebecca Stevens is director of the Child Advocacy Center at Best Self Behavioral Health, and she's a former program supervisor of crisis services. And our friend, Dr. Stephen Turkovich, president now of uh, Oshai Children's Hospital and uh, uh, continues as chief medical officer there as well, where he leads the hospital's daily operations, clinical and support services, community physician relations, offsite pediatric and obstetric pr uh, primary clinics. He is a leader in advocating for children and families in our community as a trusted medical expert who works tirelessly to collaborate with organizations throughout Western New York to positively impact the health and well-being of our community. So we have a lot to talk about in uh, this half hour. Rebecca, we're gonna start with you. So as the director of the Child Advocacy Center, I know that you coordinate investigations, treatment, prosecution, child abuse cases. It's all accomplished through partnerships with the Department of Social Services, the Erie County Child Protective Services, so many organizations, Erie County Law Enforcement, the district attorney. You're integrating with so many, including medical facilities like Oshai Children's Hospital. Why so many entities? What does each role play? And let's understand that before we had child advocacy centers, you had to all work much differently. So laying all that out, let's give us the groundwork for what we're about to discuss. There's a couple of things. Um, New York state law actually requires some of us to work as partners in the investigation, evaluation, treatment, and prevention of child abuse. But also, as just a whole, we want to bring as many entities together that help care for children so we can have as positive impact for kids as we can. Before there were child advocacy centers, kids might disclose at a, at a school, tell their teacher or a friend that something was happening. 
The teacher would then tell the school nurse. The nurse would then tell the guidance counselor. The guidance counselor would tell the principal. And it's estimated that a child would have to retell their story up to 15 times over the course of an, evalu of an investigation, each time being re-traumatized by having to repeat that. What we hope for at the Child Advocacy Center is we bring all those entities together in one site and have to reduce the number of times a child has to repeat what they're saying. So I can't imagine the child telling that story more than once is traumatizing enough, let alone getting somebody to believe them, you know, back in, the, in those days. So coming to the CAC is, is a safe haven. Absolutely. We wrap all the services around them, whether it be medical from our friends at OSHAI, investigations with our law enforcement partners, but also social services and uh, therapy to help really send that child towards healing. Let's bring in some of our guests who are on Zoom. Dr. Ashraf. Why do you think we're experiencing a high level of child abuse in Erie County? The this, this, this statistic is startling, 3,000 children a year, and, and it's so many, and it's, all, it's, for me, difficult to comprehend. I'm sure our viewers would feel the same. Do you think there's some specific sociological and economic situations that are present in Erie County that are contributing to this high rate of abuse, and how can you address that? Yeah, so I 100% agree with you. That statistic, that number is very high, and what's even more alarming is that there are many cases that uh, of children who are being maltreated that are not reported. So the true number is actually even higher than that. Um, and when we talk about child maltreatment, that really includes um, all forms of abuse as well as neglect. And so uh, when we focus on rates and why they're so high, we have to think about risk factors. So what puts a child at risk of maltreatment? Um, there are uh, victim and perpetrator specific risk factors, but um, let's talk about the psychosocial risk factors. Uh, and that would include family and community risk factors. So on the family level, um, families um, who are experiencing poverty, families with increased um, numbers of household members, especially children, um, families who have caregivers with drug or alcohol problems, mental health problems, caregivers in the home who are not biological parents, if there's domestic violence in the home, all of those things really increase a child's risk of being maltreated. Additionally, I wanna point out that families who are isolated or who aren't connected to other people become stressed as well. And a really good example of that um, were the uh, COVID lockdowns or the, the lockdowns during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then when we look at community or societal risk factors, things like high rates of uh, violence or crime in the community, poverty, high unemployment rates, if there's easy access to drugs or alcohol, food insecurity. So, so you know, all of these family and community risk factors are prevalent in Erie County. Um, I also wanna point out that Erie County is a, in a special position because on top of all of those risk factors that are already present, there has been a lot of um, additional grief and trauma that has been experienced not only over the past year, but you know, go going back to the start of the pandemic. So this all undoubtedly leads to significant family and community stress and increases maltreatment rates. A lot there to comprehend and uh, a lot of socio sociological and economic conditions to, to weigh in there. Lieutenant Mann, let's bring you into the conversation now. You know, what role does the police department have and you specifically in working with these cases and, and, and how do you refer them to the CA, to the Child Advocacy Center or do you handle them as a police issue first and then move it to the, to the next level? So cases come in typically in a few different ways. Sometimes uh, children are brought directly to the hospital, you know, uh, most often in physical abuse cases, but sometimes in sexual abuse cases. Others result uh, from a call to the state hotline, either by a mandated reporter, uh, teachers and physicians and such, or uh, by a member of the community. And then the third way is, is sometimes people call the police directly. Whichever way the case comes in though, we then contact the uh, uh, case coordinator at the Child Advocacy Center to begin the process of, of intake and of scheduling an interview with the child, and then uh, the center takes care of any additional medical or, or uh, uh, social or support needs that the child or family might have. So when you get that word, or the police department does, do you automatically trigger into the CAC, or do you gauge 
the situation before it moves to that level? Uh, every case goes to the case. CAC. Yeah. So every, uh, every one of the abuse or uh, uh, severe neglect cases that we're talking about are taken care of by the team. So we always use the team approach, and that team resides at the Child Advocacy Center. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the hospital, Oshai Children's Hospital, being one of the facilities, I'm sure, and Dr. Turkovich, who's joining us via Zoom. Uh, can you talk about the role of Oshai Children's Hospital in these child abuse cases? There's a lot here. What kind of help is given to a child uh, who's a victim of child abuse, and maybe even the other affected family members? Who examines the child, and how do you help them recover and heal from the, the trauma? And, uh, and your role specifically in handling some of these cases over the years. And do you work with the CAC when all of this comes together at the hospital? Yeah, I think the one word that really encapsulates what we do is team, uh, because it does take a, a significant team to care for children and families who have a child or children who have been victims of abuse. So here at the hospital, we obviously have a significant focus on the medical care, um, but the bridges that we build and the connections that we build to make sure that their physical safety, um, it continues after their discharge from the hospital and working with CPS and law enforcement, their psychological care and mental health care and working with our partners at Best Self, um, as well as other mental health providers within the community. Um, and then specifically the child and helping them physically and mentally heal. Uh, so many times kids will come to the emergency room um, with any uh, degree of injury. We see some relatively minor injuries, which are, are bruising, all the way up to very severe, life-threatening, and sometimes um, devastating injuries uh, that require a multidisciplinary approach with our trauma team, our pediatric surgeons, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons. Um, some kids require critical care in our pediatric ICU. Um, and, and sometimes injuries are not apparent if they initially to, to be due to abuse. And so um, there are other explanations that have come forward from the beginning, and it takes the entire team's both medical experience and um, understanding, as well as the experience of Dr. Ashraf and her team, and looking at it from a child abuse physician's lens to put the type of injury uh, together, the radiologic findings, the pattern of injury, the reported story, or how the story has changed to determine if the injury was a result of a non-accidental trauma or abuse. And that's a difficult thing to do at times because it may not be clear. Um, so we have multiple uh, paths that we need to go down. One of them is obviously treating the child's acute injuries. The other one is determining the cause of those injuries. And then it is partnering um, with those mental health providers as well as law enforcement and CPS to make sure that when the child is ready to be discharged from the hospital, they're discharged into a safe environment um, the, um, the elements that law enforcement needs in order to fully prosecute the perpetrator um, are clear and consistent. Um, so that's why it's so important that we are a seamless team. Um, obviously, the patients look at us uh, as part of a care journey. And regardless of the entity that's providing that care, uh, we need to be uh, in lockstep to make sure that we are making sure that communication is clear uh, and that each entity understands the nature of the injury, but then also where that patient and family is in their healing. You bring up an interesting point, uh, Dr. Turkovich. The people that are bringing the child perhaps to the hospital who perpetrated this crime may tell you that it's something that it isn't, an accident, for example. I, I can't imagine how you would have to sort through and navigate what's fact from fiction. You know, that, that is extremely difficult, and, and Dr. Ashraf is especially trained in really understanding and looking at patterns of injury, understanding the story and the mechanism of injury that was reported, and does the story correlate um, with the type of injury that we're seeing. It requires understanding different types of fractures and, and how they present, different radiologic findings on chest x-ray, on, on head cat scans and types of bleeding. Also understanding, are there underlying organic causes? So things that can look like abuse, but actually caused by an underlying disease that may be not yet diagnosed, a bleeding disorder or something like that. Um, so it really requires a deep understanding of multiple different types of pathophysiology and partnering with different subspecialists to put the story together and really make a determination, was this true abuse and non-accidental trauma or was this the result of something else? So, Dr. Ashraf, we'll, we'll jump ahead then to you, because with that, you're a board-certified child abuse pediatrician. What is that most important aspect 
in, in treating the children once you see them in these situations when they come into the hospital, when the trauma is experienced? Yeah, so I think uh, Dr. Turkovich outlined everything perfectly right there. So, you know, when we are asked to evaluate children uh, medically, uh, my team specifically, uh, and whether it be physical or sexual abuse, it's primarily to help determine whether or not abuse has occurred. That's the primary question for us. Or is there another explanation, like Dr. Turkovich pointed out, medical, accidental, that could explain the findings or just the abuse concerns in general? Um, Dr. Tarkovich also touched on the, you know, one of the most important things is just making sure that if a child has, um, requires urgent medical attention, we refer and get that sorted out. Um, if we, as the medical team, are the first point of contact um, among the uh, CAC partners um, in, that the child or family comes in contact with, we make sure that we refer to our partner CAC services. So therapy, forensic interview, law enforcement, DSS, um, linking them up with a child advocate at the CAC. This is all stuff that the medical team could do if we do, if we are the first point of contact. But we are uh, first and foremost pediatricians. So the health and well-being of child and family unit is of priority. Uh, we make sure that the families know that, they're aware of this, and this really helps them maybe feel more at ease, more comfortable, and they may share things and open up uh, with the medical team. Um, we hope to um, help children and families process some of their trauma through the evaluation itself. Um, there is a great sense of relief and reassurance that, um, you know, a child gets and a family family gets as well um, to know that their body is healthy, that they'll grow and develop normally, regardless of what happened to them. Rebecca is shaking her head to, in agreement for all this because, you know, that's the next step. You know, we hear a CAC, CSC, Child Advocacy Center, because now you're the next step in this process. And what is the environment like at the CAC when, when the family or the child, the parent go there? Mm -hmm. We work really hard to make the environment, because we know a trauma has happened to this family and to this child, we try to make the environment as cozy, as comfortable as possible. It's, we're required by our guidelines to have a child appropriate facility. What that means for us is we're really taking into the environment, the safety and the emotional feelings that the families have when they walk in. There are, um, toys for kids of all ages. Certainly we deal with a lot of little kids, but if we have teenagers in the in the building, we don't want them to feel like they're being treated like they're coming to a, a, a daycare or a child, a small a place for small children. Um, so we have toys. Um, we really look at things like our bookcases and those are fastened to the wall so that no accidents can happen and children can be hurt. It's a really, um, culturally sensitive and gender sensitive environment to make kids and families feel as, as comfortable as possible, especially because sometimes they could be there for hours at a time. Yeah. So we want that stay to not feel sterile or overwhelming. Dr. Turkovich, let's go back to you. With children involved, and, and I know that some of them have to go to the hospital as a result of their injuries, what do you see when you see those injuries come in? And uh, tell us about the treatment that they get. You know, we, we see a wide variety of different types of injuries. We've talked about sexual abuse and uh, many times parents will bring a child to the emergency room because the child may have disclosed something. Uh, we see teenagers who have been victims of sexual abuse um, or rape. And so we've got specially trained nurses that uh, work with our medical team to investigate, to um, make sure that the, 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 the child or the young adult feels safe. They collect the evidence if, if they're within a certain time frame so that prosecution can occur. We provide medication in case that there's any risk for any sexually transmitted um, disease. Um, and then we also see children who have bruising, burns, fractures. Um, we have children who've got, uh, unfortunately, bleeds in their head from shaken baby um, or other sorts of head trauma. And so the, the variety of types of, Ill, of, of injuries that we see, unfortunately, are, are quite, quite wide. Um, many kids uh, don't require admission to the hospital, which is why it's even more important that they continue to follow up at the CAC, because at the initial presentation of the hospital, it may not be clear whether or not the injury was secondary to abuse. 
Um, and so additional testing needs to occur after they're discharged, um, watch the evolution of the, the, the pattern of bruising and things like that, and also additional testing. So that linkage with the CAC is so, so important, especially from the emergency room, to make sure that their workup um, to determine if abuse had occurred uh, is completed. Um, but as I said, it's a wide variety of, of diseases and, and, and injuries. And unfortunately, sometimes these children do require critical care in our ICUs. Yeah, I would imagine. We talked about the child and the environment that you provide, that you provide at CAC, and it's kind of a child-appropriate environment. Is it a 24-hour situation, Rebecca, where if something happens, say somebody goes into the hospital at 4 in the morning, is there something that happens on a 24-hour basis at the CAC? Right now, our office hours are typical Monday through Friday hours. We can be on call in the event that there wasn't an emergency, but most of the time what we're talking about is a child talking about what's happened to them. Certainly the medical exams, there's a need for 24-hour response as well as law enforcement in order to protect children. But at four o'clock in the morning, is a six-year-old really wanting to talk about what happened to them just now? Yeah. Or is that child going home, getting a good night's sleep and coming in in a day or two when they've had time to process that trauma? It's probably better for the child. It's also probably better for the investigation because their ability to talk about it would be better for them. Are you governed by Erie County or state mandates as to how the facility has to be operated? It's uh, New York State requirements as well as the National Children's Alliance, which are national um, requirements as well. We were overseen annually by New York State and every five years by the National Children's Alliance. Wow, that's a lot. We only have a few <laughs> minutes left in this part one of the conversation. And I know on the screen, you're looking at the various phone numbers and websites, uh, and we're gonna have more of those in just a little bit because you wanna speak up. If you see something, say something. I've heard that phrase, and I guess that would really hold true to this. But in our last question, I'd kind of throw this out to everybody who can communicate this. Let's clarify that despite the overwhelming number of cases, you know, we say 3,000 in the statistic that we, we saw, if you're caring for, a, a, say, 1,000, what happens to the other children? Where do they go? And, and you know, and is there enough capacity to handle uh, what seems to be an overwhelming number of cases. Uh, how, how does that connect with our community? I'll leave that to Rebecca maybe to start with you and then <laughs> okay. Lieutenant Mann. Um, our current facility is woefully under, undersized. Um, we only have one medical evaluation room. We only have one forensic interview room and we're really not being able to serve the children in this community that we can. Um, we, we want to be able to have children, wh whoever needs us, whatever time they need us to come to us and right now, we're really not able to do that. Um, but there's a plan in place. I, do you want me to talk about that yeah, now? Yeah, <laughs> let's go. We have about a minute left. <laughs> okay. Um, we are in the process of building a new child advocacy center, which will be located at 899 Main Street. It's right near our medical campus, close to Oshai Children's Hospital, and will more than quadruple our ability to serve children in the community. So really, any child who's coming forward can come and get the help that they need as soon as possible. We know that the sooner they report and the sooner they come forward, the better outcomes they have and the better outcomes the investigations have. So we've, and Lieutenant Mann, in the years, you know, because we go back to the Channel 7 days doing stories, in the years that you've been involved, it's, it's changed for the better, I would think. You know, and hearing about this plan for this new CAC and hearing about what the doctors do, it's, it's so much more comprehensive. Yeah, it's absolutely changed for the better, and we're working towards the, the goals that we've had for, for many decades now. <laughs> Dr. Turkovich has been involved as long as I have, and um, we, you know, we have a new children's hospital, and now we're working on a new child advocacy center, and that'll give us the infrastructure we need to do a better job. Well, I want to thank all of our guests for joining us for part one of this important conversation. Now, before we end the program, we have some important contact information uh, that you need to know. And then we're going to continue this conversation next week on our community conversation here on WBBZ TV. So stay with us now because we have some important phone numbers and websites that you need to know. We want you to get a pen and paper, write down some of these phone numbers and websites. You may find them to be very helpful. And as we said, if you see something, say something. If you need to see emotional and informational videos, you need to go to enoughabuse.org. The Child Abuse Campaign Training, you can contact Megan Dudziak, Education and Outreach Coordinator, to schedule a training for your organization. Here's an email, mdudziak at bestselfwny.org. Or you can call 
5437, extension 567. To donate to help build that new child advocacy center, you can make a donation by sending a check to the Best Self Foundation, 255 Delaware Avenue in Buffalo. The zip is 14202. And you can designate your donation to the Child Advocacy Center at Best Self. And you can also download a donation form at this website, cacbuffalo.org slash make a donation. Very important to report child abuse. If a child is in immediate danger, you need to call 911. There's a child abuse hotline for New York State. It's 800-342-3720. There's also a mandated reporter hotline in New York State. This number is 800-635-1522. And trafficking and exploitation, that hotline is 315-218-1966. You can contact the Child Advocacy Center. They're at 556 Franklin Street in Buffalo. Phone there is 716-886-5437. And there's an email, cacinfo at bestselfwny.org. Now there are more links and videos and all of this contact information that I just gave you. We're gonna present that on our website, which is wbbz.tv, and it'll be there for a while. And we wanna thank Annette Pinder at Buffalo Health for Living Magazine for producing these important community conversations with our participating sponsors. Thanks for watching, be safe and be well. This special edition of your hometown Health Connection Community Conversations, Heal, Talk, Act, was presented by Buffalo Healthy Living Magazine with support from the Buffalo Federation of Neighborhood Centers, Kyramia Pet Resort, Circuit Clinical, Endeavor Health Services, Medical Society of the County of Erie, the National Federation for Just Communities, People Incorporated, Community Services for Everyone, Horizon Health Services, Spectrum Health and Human Services, Best Self Behavioral Health, and WBBZ-TV. Being your best self starts with mental health. Whatever struggles you're facing, best self is here to help. But the smallest voices need the most help being heard. Children who are the most vulnerable can't always speak up for themselves. Getting help early is crucial before it has a lasting impact on their lives. One out of 10 children will be sexually abused before they reach age 18. And we can't stop it if we don't talk about it. Donate to Best Self's Child Advocacy Center at cacbuffalo.org.